Well, good morning, family. Good morning, good morning. It's so great to be with you today. Blessings. Happy Sunday to those of you that are joining us online this morning. We love you so much. We pray that God is ministering to you right where you are as he is in this room today. Thank you for joining us today, family. We want to encourage you to find your seats and grab a pen, flip over that announcement sheet. We'll get to that at the end of the service, but let's, let's prepare our hearts to receive from the Word of God today. Amen? It's, we're here to open our lives to say, God, have your way in us. God, we want to learn. How many want to learn and want to grow today? Say amen. We want to grow. Amen. We want to be, become all that God has called us to be and intended for us to be. This week has been an amazing week for Pastor Cynthia and myself and our team. It started on Tuesday with our Northern California Regional Pastors Connect on Tuesday at one of our Foursquare churches here in the Bay Area in Danville, The Rock. An amazing day. We had 130 pastors and leaders from around the region that were there to receive uh, from teaching, and we enjoyed some great times of worship and fellowship together. Just an amazing day. And then how many ladies were at the women's retreat yesterday? Yeah, fantastic. Almost 200 ladies were at the women's retreat in Folsom, California over this weekend. And uh, I was there just briefly to help Cynthia load in and get set up and had the privilege of leading a little bit of worship yesterday. But man, God's just doing great, great stuff. So good, so good. Well, family, if you brought your Bibles or you want to follow along on your phone, l- join me in the book of Acts, chapter 6, if you would. We are in our, our series for the beginning of the year. The theme that the Lord has given us is sent, meaning that we are living as apostolic people, people who are sent by God, who are living on co-mission with the Lord. And do you know that the book of Acts is actually referred to as the Acts of Apostolic People, the Acts of Sent People. And so we knew that, man, Lord, we want to jump right into this first century narrative, and we want to be able to see the parallels that you're working in our lives as a church family. Acts chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, I'm going to go ahead and read through all 15 verses, and then we'll, we'll come back around and unpack that together. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon and Pumbaa. Does your Bible say Timon and Pumbaa? No, absolutely. Gosh, this is the wrong version. Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. And then they secretly persuaded, and I want you to see that that word persuaded is really that they lied, they bore false witness, false witness against Stephen. They lied to some men to say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And of course he did not do that because he was moving in the power of the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit is not gonna con- contradict the Holy Spirit. 
who inspired the word of God. Amen? Come on, somebody. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they seized Stephen. And they brought him before the Sanhedrin, and they produced false witnesses. Again, false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come today before you with humble hearts, with open hands, with a spirit that's ready to receive what you have for us today. May your word today be in our lives, a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. May it give us instruction in righteousness and godliness. May we align our lives with the truth of your word. We thank you so much, God, for your presence in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. So what do we see here, family? Well, one, we see that the church is growing, amen? The church is growing. The Bible begins there in, in verse 1 of chapter 6 to say that, that as the, the number of the disciples was increasing. Now, when we see the, the disciples here, we're not just referring to the 12 disciples who are now the 12 apostles. We're talking about disciples. You're a disciple, or at least you should be. How many know that there's a difference between being a follower and being a disciple? Right? There's a lot of people who follow Jesus that were not necessarily disciples. And discipleship is when we submit ourselves to the word and the teaching and, 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 and the, the mentoring of the Holy Spirit in our lives with discipline, with sound doctrine, and we begin to actually walk into and live out of the new creation that God has called us to be. So not only are we called to be disciples, but we're called to be disciple makers. And that's what it means to live as sent people. And so we see that the numbers of the church are growing there. Revival has broken out in Jerusalem through the church. Many people are getting saved. Growth is awesome. How many say growth is awesome? Amen? But like in any other organization, in even a family, when growth occurs, what often accompanies it? Growing pain. And we're seeing that here in the first century church. And we see that there's a group that is complaining because they are, are saying that their, their needs are not being met. And I, I wanted just to say a couple of things about this because, again, what we're doing is we're, we're looking at the word of God. We're walking in the theme and, and, and the direction that the Lord has given us for this year to live as sent people. And this book, The Acts of Apostolic or Sent People, is, is going to be an instruction manual for us. This is really training ground for the marketplace. We're learning to live as, as the people of God in, in genuine community so that we can be effective for the kingdom. And so we see that there are some that are complaining. And honestly, to, to some degree, they're right. Sometimes when growth occurs, we're not always ready for every nuance of that growth. And so things can fall through the cracks. But is complaining the best way to approach this? I think that we can learn something from this. How many would agree that the bridge is a great church? Yeah. Hey. Oh, that, was, that was so bad, honestly, I want to just stop now. I just, how many believe that the bridge is a great church? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm sensitive, guys. And if you look around uh, in, our, in our sanctuary here this morning, you see that we're, we're beginning to grow a little bit, which is exciting, isn't it? Um, after the pandemic and all the things that have gone along with that and and, and, you know, most churches in America are seeing about 50% of their people coming back in, in person. And uh, we're seeing about that. We, we lost a lot of people over the last two or three years. And for a myriad of reasons that it's not my intent to dig into this morning. 
but I'm beginning to see some growth in us, and I'm really excited about that. And so the question that I want to ask you as part of this family is what are you going to do in an occasion where you feel like something is being overlooked or something is not going the way that you would want it to go? What do we do? Complain? I hope not. I hope that we would protect the unity that we have by believing the best, first of all, and then by bringing your suggestion to the leadership. Coming with an open hand to say, hey, it's just something I've noticed, right? The context that we're reading about here in Acts chapter 6 is, is, is creating division. These complaints are actually causing a, a scenario where people are picking sides and pointing fingers. If you dig down deep into the text, as I've done this last week. And then what's happening there is that the enemy is getting involved. See, the enemy is not God. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. He is not, not omnipotent. His only skill is that he's an excellent study of human behavior. Is that he listens to every word you say. And he watches what you do. And he keeps copious notes on your life. And that's what's happening here. And it's this division, this disunity is getting stirred up in the church. And that could happen here. That has happened here in times past. And I want you to know that this is not to say that we've got it all together all the time. We're still becoming just like you. We try really hard. One of the things I've learned over the last 25 years of pastoring is that I cannot please everyone as your pastor. Some of you are like, what are those pants? You know? It's just, I, this is me doing me. I, I've realized that once I, 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 I please this table, this table's livid. Unity in the body is not uniformity. It's not sameness. And it's okay for us to know that there are things that we're going to disagree on. But even in our disagreement, we are commanded to love. We are commanded to believe the best about one another. We are commanded to, to stand with one another, to continue to walk in agreement, which doesn't mean that we necessarily always agree, but we're willing to humbly lay down our offenses or our differences for the greater value of the person that we're walking with. And this is so vital in our witness to the world. Would you agree? I've experienced way too many times where people, even in our church, like the church here in Jerusalem, have become offended or disappointed with something that's not going the way that they would want it to go. And they will sometimes unknowingly allow that offense to go so deeply in their heart that the enemy will begin to use that to create division and distance. And the next thing we know, we're so-and-so. They've left the church. Nobody even knows why. I can't tell you how many conversations, painful conversations, Cynthia and I have had over the last 25 years where folks have come to us and unfortunately they've been offended or disappointed but they, they never addressed it and they allowed so much time to transpire. Never approaching us that the festering of that offense in most cases is irreparable. God wants to do a great work in his church. God wants to call his people to another level of maturity. That doesn't mean that you're going to be in one church for the rest of your life. But I think it does mean that we don't, we don't do anything unless God is calling us to do it and leading us to do it. I, I'm a stayer. 
That's just how I'm wired. Not everybody is that way. This is, this is not to sound disparaging at all, but there have been many times over the last even 21 years that I've been honored to serve you as your pastor that, man, there have been times where my flesh has said, nah, this is too hard. But because God wasn't directing me to do something else, I stay. And I stay faithful in what I'm doing now until God says do something else. God's calling us to a level of maturity because the world needs to see a unified church. The world needs to see us loving each other. And unfortunately, in the times that we're living in, the church is as much a consumer culture as the world. People are going to the shiny, new, and the best, and the, they've got this thing and that thing and the bells and the whistles. And you know, if you've been with us for a long time, you remember about 15 years ago, we had every bell and whistle there is. And then when we lost those bells and whistles, we lost 75% of our church. How many remember the temple? That was fun. <laughs> the silver lining of the temple was Gavin and Teresa Parrish. Who came to, <laughs> oh my goodness. So how do these issues of disunity affect our ability to live as sent people? Well, again, they weaken our witness. And I believe that unity is vital and it's Bible. It's God's dream for his church. Amen. Amen. Being sent does not mean being a lone ranger. Being sent means living on mission with others. The people around you here, amen? How do I know that this is important to God? Because his word says it is. In Psalm 133, verse one, the psalmist writes, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. How good and pleasant it is. Jesus prays in John chapter 17, verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone, and that them alone is, is referring to the disciples that he was with at that time. Now he's praying for us. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. How many, somebody say, that's me. What does Jesus pray for us, family? That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. How important is our unity? But we will disagree. I will disappoint you, maybe today. But we have to believe the best about each other. We have to be quick to forgive. And we have to be the change we hope for instead of standing at a distance, amen? I love what God does next in this passage. How many know that the Bible says that God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose? So God even turns the enemy's agenda to bring division in the church for their good. And he gives us a beautiful model of how to walk in seasons of growth and increase. Instead of trying to manage it all themselves, God gives the, the apostles the wisdom to enlist help to tap into the gifts that were already resident in the church but had not been utilized yet. Do you know that one of my favorite things about Table Talk is the ability that it, that it provides for someone. One of you is going to kind of take the lead at your table today, right? And in doing so, 
You are partnering with the leadership of this church. You're coming in to kind of shepherd that time. You know why that's so cool? Because I've been in church my whole life. And I know that in this church right now, there are people who are leading that had God not given us the vision to reconfigure the furniture, would have been content till Jesus came back to sit still, face forward, and not say a word. I, I loved our time at uh, Bowditch at the middle school. I really did. I love that time. I'll always look back on that time and cherish it because that was the beginning of this. That was the time that God said, son, what do you want to do? And I, I was like, I didn't know that was on the table. And I said, God, I, I want to create an atmosphere where people can talk about their faith where they could grow in their knowledge of, of who you are by sharing and dialoguing and ministering to one another. I don't want our church to be a hierarchy of leadership. I want it to be a community of priests. One of my favorite things about Table Talk at Bowditch was, do you guys remember we had all the black pipe and drape that were on the side of the gym, right? Because that gym was butt ugly. I said butt in church. One of my favorite Sundays, one of our tables didn't have a t the, the table leader for that table didn't show up that day. And Pastor Cynthia asked Matt Shasky, Ray's husband, would he be the table leader that day? And Matt's, the, he'll do anything. He's the best. He said, I'll do it. He had never been a table leader before. He hadn't come to the training, right? He hadn't done any of that other stuff. And he just said, I'll do it. And he just sat there at the table. And I remember after my message, I used to love to walk around the back of the curtain where you couldn't see me and listen in on the conversations at the table. Do you guys know I was there? Okay. Just want to make sure they were, you know, sound doctrine and whatnot. So I remember coming behind the curtain that day and and I came to where Matt's table was. And this is a guy that had been in this church long before we came here. And I remember listening to Matt lead this table. He had so much insight that would have never otherwise been tapped into. And he's, he was telling stories and he was super funny. But there was a great engagement that was happening at that table that day. And I thought, man, this is the best thing ever. We're better together. This is a beautiful thing that God did here in Jerusalem. Because there was a lot of really gifted people that hadn't been tapped into yet. You know that even if I could do everything that needs to be done, that doesn't mean that I should. Or even our, even our team should. I think in doing so, we would disregard what Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians, that we're a body, we're a family, and every, every part is meaningful and has equal value. We have different roles. That's okay. But those roles never have anything to do with worth. They're just roles, right? One of the things I love about this passage is that as you begin to read it, you say, oh, wow, they needed care for the widows, so they needed people to wait on tables. It actually talks about waiting on tables, which, you know, is my jam. And that's what we love to do, Right? But when we see the people that are selected, we recognize that every role in the body of Christ is meaningful and deserves our best. Why? Because it says select men who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That didn't just sound like waiting on tables. What do I want you to see in this? Is that we need everybody. You're not here to be a spectator. If you need a season to be a spectator, take it. But when you're ready, we've got a place for you to use your gifts. We've got a place for you to, to step into another level of partnership here at the church that is going to be one of the biggest growth seasons of your life. Ask anybody who's currently serving, and they'll tell you that. Right? So good what God does here. Though our roles may be different, they are equally valuable. In fact, Stephen, one of the guys that's selected, is the first non-apostle to be moving in signs and wonders and gifts. Right? And is he doing that in the temple? 
Not necessarily. Guess what? He might be doing that in line to get the food. He just, would you like some potatoes? And prophesied. He's in the back. New volunteers are coming in. They're serving. Finds out somebody needs prayer. Something's going on with their family. He's praying. People are getting healed. People are getting set free. People are getting saved. Why? When he's just rubbing elbows. When he's just setting up or breaking down tables or doing the coffee. When he's working with the babies. When, he's work, when someone's working with the kids. Are you with me? It's the same spirit. And he wants to move in all of us. And here's the great piece about this, guys, is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we read about in Acts chapter 2 are not just supposed to be a cool expression of what happens inside these four walls on Sunday morning. It's mostly for the world. Jesus didn't say, wait for the Holy Spirit, the gift the Father promised, and you will be endued with power to teach an intercessory Bible study. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and we teach intercessory Bible studies. It wasn't just about what's happening inside the four walls. He said, you need the power to be a martyr. You need the power to be a witness. So here's the beauty. When we all step up, when we take our place in the body, we're getting the training that we need to be effective in the marketplace. Amen. I love what it says in chapter 7. Look again at Acts 6, 7. So the word of God spread. How? Through the apostles' teaching, probably. But what is the context here? The context is that the church is growing. God speaks vision. What is vision? God speaks into something that is not yet as it should be. That's what all that vision is. And we need it because the Bible says without it we perish. We live without restraint. And even in what seems like a menial thing, in the food distribution to the widows, the word of God spread rapidly. Isn't that powerful? There's no menial task in the kingdom. None. It all matters. It all matters. What do I want you to get from this? This is one of our takeaways. When the church is working together, everyone doing their part in giving and serving and leading, the result is health and growth. Amen? And then, of course, what do we see? Opposition. <laughs> right? The enemy is stirring up jealousy and discord among the leaders, the religious leaders of the church, and they begin to target Stephen. And we're going to talk about that next week, but I want us to really just lean in as, as I close here in just a couple of minutes on our walk away. Statistics in church have long shown that 20% of the people in the church do 80% of the work. It's called the 80-20 rule. Have you ever heard of that before? It's, it might be true in a lot of organizations, but it's mostly true in church. So what do we do? What do we do to reverse that? What do we do to change that? Think about the difference that it would make not only in our congregation, but in our collective communities. If we were to be able to raise that percentage. Less than 40% of church members in the United States tithe. But this is the primary way that God has designed his church to flourish. And what we see in it is that if we were obedient to the tithe, Money would never be an issue for the church. We'd always have enough to do everything that needs to be done. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. What if we could raise now? Our church is way above that average. And that was one of the other beautiful things that happened with mobile church. <laughs> right? I mean, it took a village to set up Bowditch. Right? You know, every Sunday after church, you guys, we know we break down the tables. Why do we do that? Well, because we have two other churches that, that we rent space to here at the bridge. And we want to be a blessing to them. And we want, don't want to have to them, them to have to come in and do extra work because we know what that was like. And so that's still kind of, it's not really that we're mobile per se, but it, we're, we still get to do work. We still get to partner with one another. I remember having people come to me when we were doing mobile church at Bowditch that said, if we ever get a building, I'm leaving the church. They left before we got a building, but that's another story. <laughs> the point was, I love the community that's built through this partnership, right? 
And that's what I want to encourage you with today. So surprise, surprise, Pastor Teresa is going to be giving you some opportunities during our announcement time later on of areas where we want to invite you to come and serve with us. We want to invite you, if maybe you have been kind of waiting for this invitation, you're invited. You're invited. And we're going to give you, uh, we want to give you things to do that you're passionate about. And sometimes that takes a little while. So don't be afraid to volunteer for a ministry thinking that you're going to be stuck in that till Jesus comes back. <laughs> <laughs> if you hate it, we'll help you find something else. Right? We're better together. Do you believe that? Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. One of the things that I love about the season that we're in right now is that over the last 21 years, whenever we've been in a season like this where there's been a lull, but we start to kind of see some movement, I know that God's working. And what I believe God is doing now that I want to invite you to be a part of is that there's increase in our future family. And God is, again, fortifying our foundation. He's fortifying the fundamentals of who we're called to be as the body of Christ so that when the growth comes, we're able to sustain it and flourish. Amen? Amen. I love you so much. God bless you. Enjoy your table talk together.